My name is Barry Downing. I recently retired after 34 years as pastor of Northminster Presbyterian Church in Endwell, New York. I earned a BA degree in physics from Hartwick College in 1960, uh, went to Princeton Seminary and graduated in 1963, and then earned my PhD in the field of science and theology at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, I was then ordained as a Presbyterian pastor in 1967. I wrote the book, The Bible and Flying Saucers, soon after returning from Edinburgh, and it was first published in 1968. The basic thesis I have is that UFOs are real. Uh, as Stan Friedman does his story, that flying saucers are real, uh, I believe that story. And I also believe that UFOs have been around for thousands of years and have guided the development of life on Earth, and that they probably also guided the development of the biblical religion in both the Old and the New Testament. In my book, The Bible and Flying Saucers, I argue that the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night was a UFO, which was in verbal communication with Moses, caused the uh, burning bush experience because it was on the ground then, but then hovered over the Red Sea and used its propulsion system to part it and uh, gave Moses the commandments and set up the Jewish religion in the wilderness. Uh, things in the New Testament that UFOs may have been involved in include the resurrection of Jesus. So that's kind of uh, the highlights of uh, my approach to the Bible. The first reaction of some religious people, what I would call Christian conservatives, is one of worry and fear, I think. There have been several conservative Christian books written saying that they believe UFOs are real and that they're demonic and supernatural demonic. But these same Christians don't believe in the theory of evolution, and they especially don't want to think that evolution happens everywhere in the universe, and therefore that UFOs might be a highly evolved species, uh, but natural. Uh, and so it helps uh, enforce their view of Genesis, which evolution is not true, that God just kind of made everything and did it very quickly. Um, and so the idea if UFOs, if the government released UFO information which says we think these are an evolved species, uh, this would undermine some of the most conservative Christian beliefs about creation and so on. So that's hurtful to that group. Uh, the more liberal group, <clears throat> and this is the kind of people that John Mack has been dealing with at Harvard, are people who uh, are what I would call secularists, who don't believe in God at all, and believe in evolution in its pure form. In other words, they think that we're kind of a cosmic accident, not a cosmic water gate, a cosmic accident, that we evolved out of some cosmic goo uh, by a series of uh, good luck events and genetic uh, uh, kind of transformation, but there was no God or force involved. Uh, my suggestion is that the UFO reality, which uh, is here now and is doing genetic things, uh, as Bud Hopkins and other uh, abduction researchers have pointed out, it appears that they're taking sperm samples, uniting them with eggs, maybe developing a hybrid form of life. Uh, this reality appears to be very with it <laughs> biologically. Uh, so suppose this reality has been around for, we'll say, a couple million years and uh, are very smart biologically. Uh, why wouldn't we suppose that this reality has treated the Earth as kind of a laboratory in which they developed life as we see it? Well, if that's true, then the Harvard liberals will not like this either because evolution is no longer a purely accidental thing. It's been a guided process. Uh, so that both uh, atheist views are undermined by this approach and the very conservative Christian right uh, has also faced a crisis of belief. So you've got two major belief systems here which the UFO reality challenges very directly. Uh, and then, if you do admit the UFOs are here, then the question that I ask is, who are these guys and what do they want? Now, I borrowed that phrase from the movie Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, but uh, if the UFOs are here, and if they're not explaining to us uh, what they're trying to do, uh, the idea that they can do almost anything, the idea that they can abduct us if they feel like it, that they can take sperm samples from us if they feel like it, they can put us back in our bed if they feel like it, this is such power over us, it's pretty annoying if they're not telling us why they're doing this. So also you've got the anxiety level raised. Um, that's the bad news. The good news from my point of view is we come out basically ahead for two reasons. Um, the number one reason is now we've got the possibility that we're not just an accident. Uh, part of me wonders if a lot of the kind of depression of our modern young people carrying guns to school and shooting down your fellow human beings is due to the fact that you think life is pointless and uh, and you get kind of so depressed about it that you just want to hit anything or hurt someone 
uh, out of your own pain you feel. Uh, if we find out we've been put here by some kind of higher reality, I think suddenly you can suppose maybe we do have a purpose. Uh, maybe what's going on here on Earth really has meaning. And so I think it takes away some of that depression. Uh, the other thing that's going on, though, is that it gives us the freedom to wonder again about why this reality is doing what it's doing. Uh, the essence of faith, according to the Bible, is the possibility of good things happening in the future without the certainty of it. Uh, faith for, the, for Abraham in the Bible is that he trusted God going not knowing where he was going. Uh, the biblical view of faith is that it's really necessary in order for us to be creative. And uh, if you lived in a purely scientific world where everything was predictable, you'd have no freedom. Uh, and if we live in a world now where we think there's no God and nobody has made us, uh, it's almost the same as being in a purely scientific world where all we've got ahead of us is death and that's it. Uh, when you introduce the idea that we're maybe put here by a higher reality, now we've got possibilities again, and then we've got freedom, I think. And uh, so I think uh, both of those turn out to be a positive. So what the Harvard liberals lose and what Christian conservatives lose, I think is worth losing. Um, I don't know of any Islamic statements about UFOs, but the interesting thing is that the Islamic people do believe in angels. They believe in a heavenly reality. And what I would argue is that uh, biblical scholars and Islamic scholars would need to take their idea of the angelic world and begin to uh, call it a celestial world, which is what we think the UFO world is, and say, you know, it's by a different name, but the reality may be what our ancestors thousands of years ago talked about and saw. So we should start thinking about our current reality and the ancient reality is the same reality. And then some of our fear, I think, might go away. Now, as far as Buddhism goes, or Hindu and Buddhism, this is not an area I know much about, but there's a man by the name of Dr. Richard Thompson who wrote a book called Alien Identities. And he explored the Hindu Vedic literature in terms of UFO content. And his opinion is that UFOs were very much involved in the development of the Hindu faith. Uh, and of course, Buddhism grew out of Hinduism. So the whole Eastern uh, style of, of religious thinking uh, is not foreign to the idea of UFOs. And of course, Dr. John Mack thinks that in fact, uh, the Eastern uh, approach to mysticism and to contact with other entities is more the direction we should go and that our Western scientific skepticism has made it almost impossible for us to even think about a UFO style of reality. Um, I've told Dr. Mack that he should give the Judeo-Christian tradition another chance, that I think we've got possibilities here. Uh, the thing that is perhaps easier to have happen in Hinduism, and Hinduism has a history of believing in multiple gods, uh, polytheism, and uh, so that if higher forms of reality landed in Hindu culture, uh, they might see them as godlike beings, but that's okay because there are lots of gods, and in fact, almost everything is sacred. Uh, in Hindu thinking, uh, and so it probably would not be that big a shock to Hindu mentality or to Buddhist mentality uh, to think of a higher form of reality coming here and seeing them part of the overall uh, cosmic consciousness, which is a concept that is uh, known in Buddhism and Hinduism is not so much thought of in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Um, in Hinduism and Buddhism, there isn't so much a creator that's separate from creation itself, but rather it's like there's all of uh, reality is a spiritual reality within Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, and so Hindu, those of the Hindu and Buddhist background, I think, would tend to see an alien being as in fact just part of the overall cosmic reality and not be as frightened of it as Christianity might be because Christianity has kind of divided the angelic realm into two parts, the demonic and the angelic. And so then the big debate would be, who are these guys? Are they angelic or are they demonic? And everybody would be in a panic to make a decision. Whereas I think in the Hindu and Buddhist tradition, you aren't quite in the same kind of panic to label either good or bad uh, this new reality if you're in a meeting. The question would be whether or not the UFO reality is what we would call supernatural. And the traditional Christian view is that the angels in the Bible were supernatural. The miracles in the Bible were supernatural. The parting of the Red Sea or the resurrection of Jesus was supernatural. But we had no idea of a thing that we would call technology then. And 
we're in a situation now where maybe human technology in 500 years would be able to part the Red Sea or raise Jesus from the dead. Uh, and so now we've got a third possibility. You know, the previous possibilities were that the Red Sea did not part and that uh, instead it's just a myth that the biblical people made up to kind of glorify God uh, or to glorify their own history, but it didn't happen. Or the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, that's a myth. Or it's a supernatural event. Those have been the two alternatives. And the traditional Christian view is uh, they're supernatural. But now we've got a third possibility, and it's never been thought about. No one in the church has thought about this, that the miracles in the Bible might have been due to an advanced technology from a reality from a higher world. Part of the problem is that the more advanced the technology becomes, the more supernatural it appears. Uh, I think it was Stephen Greer who said that uh, 500 years ago his cell phone would look like a supernatural thing. Uh, if George Washington were to come alive in our culture now, uh, the whole world with TV and all this kind of thing would probably look supernatural to him. So uh, the question is, did Jesus come from a supernatural realm or from a highly technical and highly advanced realm? And is this what the kingdom of heaven is that he talked about? I don't know. Uh, I just know that I think we have to open up the possibility that, in fact, the heavenly realm and where the angels are is also a highly technical realm. Uh, I think if you're going to deal with a universe that has a lot of energy in it, uh, that the question is, can you learn how to use this energy in a way which doesn't defy the laws of nature and yet gives you power over nature? Uh, one of the reasons that some people have objected to miracles is it looks like God is overcoming or denying his own laws. But technology doesn't deny the laws of nature. Technology uses nature to direct it the way we want it to go. And so the question would be then whether Jesus and the world from which he comes is a supernatural world or a highly technical world. Uh, and does a technical world almost become supernatural the more advanced you become? I think the more advanced you become, the more you're using energy forms instead of mechanics. And the more you're using energy forms, the more spiritual it looks. So maybe the spiritual world and the supernatural world and the high-tech world merge in such a way you can't really distinguish them when you get a long ways down the road. I don't know. So then, how does Jesus fit in this? I'm not sure. I'm flexible. I'm willing to <laughs> get more information. If the world of the kingdom of heaven is high-tech, it's fine with me. If it's supernatural, it's fine with me. Uh, but in any case, I would say that Jesus was put on earth by this higher reality. There was a time when he said, when he was about to be crucified, he said, don't you know that I could pray the Father and legions, the angels would come to rescue me, basically. So he saw himself as part of some higher reality that had uh, thousands of uh, supporters in it uh, that could be called on if he needed them, but he wasn't going to call on them. The shortest answer to the question, how did my congregation and the rest of the Christian world react to my theories, they ignored them. That's the shortest answer. Obviously, eyebrows were raised. When my book first came out, the local Perry, uh, newspaper carried a pretty big story. Uh, I was interviewed on TV and on radio. And I'm <clears throat> sure that the members of my congregation took a little abuse. I heard about some of this. Uh, I heard about an undertaker from my church riding to a funeral with a minister from another religion. And he said, I feel so badly for Barry Downing's congregation. I'm sure all those people are going to be led to hell by him, you know. So, uh, you know, there were some negatives. Uh, but by and large, my congregation had come to know me by the time the book came out. They didn't think I was all that weird. They thought the ideas were weird, but I seemed okay. And um, I stayed in the same church 34 years. So uh, the whole business about strangeness is weird is once you get used to weirdness, the weirdness wears off. Uh, but as far as my fellow clergy, they knew I did this. They'd asked me some questions about it. But I think that, uh, I think they basically were glad for the government denial that UFOs are there. Uh, there's a sense in which everybody out there, if they want to, can say they're not there because the government says they're not there. Uh, if the government starts saying, yes, they're real, then all my fellow clergy friends <coughs> have got a problem because now they've got to ask directly, is it possible? that this reality did the things Barry says they may have done, you know. You know, my book has been out more than 30 years. Uh, anytime I send an article to a regular Christian magazine for publication, it's rejected, okay? So the Christian world I live in is totally unready, unprepared to deal with these questions. Uh, then if the UFOs are announced but real by the government, or if UFO beings land and say, hi guys, we're here, yeah, you got a crisis. 
Uh, and the crisis is going to be different depending on the religious point of view you have. Um, and I don't know which group to say will have a tougher time of it. Um, I've, you know, uh, the, there have been several books written from a conservative Christian point of view that they're demonic. And I think we're in a tricky situation. Uh, supposing the government announced the UFOs are real and they are alien enemies and we need to get the Star Wars program in position so we can gun down the UFOs when they come to attack us, okay? I think conservative Christians would buy into this. Uh, but then this is a very difficult situation. Uh, defining which is demonic has always been a very difficult task. When Jesus was on earth, the religious leaders of his day accused him of being demonic. And of course, now we're in a position where Christians say he isn't the demonic, he's the Messiah. Uh, why is it that highly trained religious people would look at Jesus and say he's demonic? Uh, <clears throat> and others looked at him and saw him as the Messiah. Uh, we've got a similar situation going on with UFOs. Some people are looking at them, looking at the abduction stories, and say, yes, this looks like demonic activity. Other people are saying, no, they're trying to save us from ourselves, and they're trying to reprogram us and develop a new genetic base so we won't be warlike and this kind of thing. And so you've got both schools. You've got the demonic school and the angelic school right here and the way it's looking at the UFO situation. Um, in terms of who's going to be most upset by this, I don't know, but I, I see people being upset uh, all over the place uh, if you suddenly make that announcement. I think that the thrust of MUFON and organizations like that has been to say we ought to expose what the government's doing and tend to see the government as um, failing in its duty to the American people or to the rest of the people in the world to bring the truth out into the open. But I suspect that the fears of uh, government leaders are to some extent justified when it comes to the whole business of religious belief systems. Um, you know, if you just look at the uh, story of Marshall Applewhite, uh, who uh, led 39 people to suicide in California because uh, a comet was coming through the sky and he thought Jesus was coming in a UFO behind the comet, and if they all died together, Jesus would come and take them. You know, that's kind of a direction where a religious fanaticism and UFOs and a funny, funny kind of blend of Christianity and Buddhism, which is what he had blended together, uh, that this kind of religious mix becomes suicidal. Now, if you're a government leader and you say, what's going to happen if we release UFO information? Maybe you see this kind of suicide all over the place and you think, no way are we going to let this truth out. So, uh, yeah, I think the religious dimension of this is very complex, and although I'm in favor of releasing UFO information itself, uh, I don't throw stones too hard at the government because of their policy, because I think they have legitimate concerns.